Hi everyone and welcome back to another week of insights and this week we've got an amazing guest joining us and I'm so pleased she's able to. She's an extraordinary individual, she's a paraclimber and so much more as you're about to discover in this interview. So it's a real pleasure to say good morning to Anusha Hussain. Good morning Anusha. Hi and hi everyone. Well, you, you've got an extraordinary story, and I think we should probably start from the very, very beginning before we get into your paraclimbing and all of your charity work. And uh, you were saying just before we started the call here today about some um, some targets and some things you're going to be doing this year, which uh, to me just seem just absolutely unbelievable. But let's start at the very beginning. You um, were born in Luxembourg. And you obviously have a, a, quite a pretty different upbringing to many people who, who are watching today. But give us an idea, first of all, about your parents when they found out that you had a limb difference and, and how it was in that very beginning stage. Um, so um, basically, I was, I was born. We had no idea I was going to have a limb difference. It didn't show up on the ultrasound. So I just popped out and it was a bit of a surprise. Um, and then um, when my parents sort of realised, um, Luxembourg being one, a very small country, and two, being over 30 years ago, there wasn't a lot of support out there for children with upper limb differences or anybody with a disability, really. Um, my parents used to live in London, so what they did was they actually took me up to London to get me checked out over there. Uh, we met um, a doctor in Harley Street. We met um, somebody from Steepers as well back in the day, um, but also they got in touch with Reach, and it was actually Sue Stokes that guided my parents out um uh with sort of the initial questions of is my kid going to be okay can she attend normal school and all the rest of it because the attitude in Luxembourg was I wasn't necessarily going to be able to attend normal school because I had a physical disability because back then there was still a little bit of an attitude of physical disability means maybe something cognitive going on too and what's really interesting is you know not only were you in Luxembourg uh, although, again, great that you're able to get over to the UK and um, find out about reach, but also coming from a Muslim family as well. What difference do you think that made to the whole diagnosis and acceptance and understanding of your difference? I think um, at, at that point, reach probably played a huge part in helping my parents, because obviously there is stigma in my own community and frankly in a lot of Asian communities around disability, around physical difference in particular, I'm definitely still getting from some um, sort of distant people that I know, you know, we even today they still want to fix me by finding an arm they can attach to me. Um, so I'm still getting that, you know, 30 years on. Um, so, um, but one of the, the slogans that helped my parents was that it's not disability, it's ability that counts and sort of that's kind of what I think my parents took that to heart in a really, really big way and just threw me into it and decided to just treat me like a normal child. And and obviously coming from a family of South Asians, you know, as you said, within your own community, the stigmas that it, that exist there and everything for families, because we, we don't have probably as as, better, as good a um, representation from different as, ethnic groups within reach sometimes and although obviously incredibly welcoming to maybe people who do come from your own um, community what would you say to them about reach and what reach can offer them when they're probably quite torn between what their community says and what different people are saying to them well i'd say reach can offer you simply support in a time when you're probably going to feel quite isolated especially from your own community you might get comments which are well meaning but they might hurt from your own community and that if you start taking that to heart it might impact how you're going to bring up your kid whereas if you actually you know go and attend the reach sessions go and find yourself a, a little reach buddy for your child um let them get to know other kids with limb differences because it's going to give them so much resilience. I didn't get to do that as a child because even though we were in touch with Reach, there was no online community back then. Um, and I didn't know anybody with a limb difference over here. So I felt quite isolated. I would have loved to have learned how to do my shoelaces or um, or things like that. The first time I actually met other kids with limb differences like properly was on my first Reach camp when I was 17, um, which was the last year I was eligible to go. And I begged my parents to go. They were really worried because they were going to send their daughter, Muslim community, Pakistani background on their own, on her own to Wales uh, for a week. But it changed my life. 
and, and I've I made fast that, friends. I'm still friends with a lot of the Reach kids from that year. And that's one of the messages that we like to get across in in this insights program is the is the fact that Reach is such a welcoming community from what, whatever background you have or whatever difference you might have. The fact is, you are united by your limb differences and. The, yeah. You know, having been on these weekends and seen the amazing power that they have to really boost young people's confidence is is extraordinary. So, so again, you know, just to reiterate that, I guess from you to say to people that it it really will make a big difference to their children attending all of these events. Yeah, and you can choose how much you want to be involved and how comfortable you are with that. If you're right at the beginning of your own journey with your kids' limb difference. Like, you know, and you just want to dip in and dab out of the Facebook group, for instance, and just see what other people are writing. That's perfectly fine. If you want to get more involved, get a buddy or even attend a reach, get your kids to attend a reach camp or, or more other things when things become COVID safe, for instance, then absolutely like do more. It's absolutely up to you how much you want to do. Now, we're going to uh, invite people to send in their questions in, in maybe about 10, 15 minutes time. But it's, there's a few things we want to cover first. One of the things is you seem to have developed this extraordinary level of resilience. Now, that doesn't come by accident. It's something you've developed over the years. Give us an idea of what it was like in those early years and the role that your parents played in this, because there'll be many parents watching this with really young children who've just come into the world possibly and just finding out about reach. So give us an idea of how you worked with your family and your parents, because you've got an older brother, and how you worked together to develop the resilience you have today. So I think a large part of it was that my parents really made the decision to not treat me any differently where they could avoid it. Um, so mom had me baking really, really early on, probably earlier than what is probably safe. For most kids um so I had cookies and whatever else but getting me used to getting really independent and the idea was that they wanted to stand me on my two feet when it was time for me to be an adult knowing that i have these skills and these and these things behind me but knowing that i could also problem solve when i needed to so they wanted to give me that skill um and it's the same with my brother and if ever they found especially you know the odd time you get the really awkward comments or things that aren't really pleasant, whether from my own community or otherwise, um, you know, they'd be immediately on the case to make sure I wasn't being treated in an inappropriate way. And what about um, adaptions and prosthetics? What was the conversation surrounded by that? Because it's always, um, it's always a big, big conversation at REACH. Um, so that was, that was a bit of an interesting one. Um, from, from a Pakistani background, there was a lot of pressure um, from sort of a community background style for me to look um, like everybody else, which meant I was in prosthetics from a very young age, I think already like with the spongy ones when I was six months old. Um, I used to mainly take them off to bop my brother on the head. That was kind of how I, so I, even as a young, young kid, baby, I was already sort of taking them off willingly and, and using them as weapons um, mainly. Um, I was the first kid in Europe to manage to work a myoelectric arm from Autobot. So I had quite a lot of sort of newspapers and all following me up in Germany when we did the whole launching of the arm. Um, so I've had myo arms, I've had um, since I was four, I've had hooks. Um, I moved to a bionic arm when I was 15. I now have a, a feminine bionic arm. In fact, I have it here. No, it's downstairs. Uh, but yeah, I have a feminine. It's like um, it's it's the um, the B bionic. I have the B bionic now. Um, but I would say I think I felt I was quite um, forced to maybe keep my arm on, and that made me quite um, reticent about wearing it. Uh, and when I was about twelve, I used to forget it everywhere because I used to not like wearing it in the snow, on a bus, um, in a pizza restaurant in Italy. It happened. And um, and eventually, when I was twelve, I think my dad sort of went, "Look, you're you're a young adult now," because uh, in Islam we sort of treat kids who become pubescent as adults to a certain extent. And um, he just went, "Now it's your choice." And the, the arm literally stayed in the cupboard for a few years because I've actually I'm more free without it. I would say when it comes to daily function, but then um, since I've started climbing. Um, uh, and I wanted to get into the gym to start getting stronger. One of the things I needed was a prosthetic arm. So I actually now have two arms that have been specifically designed so I can train. 
So I'm now considered in my hospital in the UK, in London, the RNOH, consider me to be like a super user. Because I come to them with a, I can't do this movement pattern and I can't do it with these things. What can you give me? <laughs> <laughs> and actually, let's talk about the climbing. You mentioned it there. When did yeah. you first discover, because, you know, we, we find... We've had an amazing series of interviews where people have talked about they're discovering music or discovering acting or uh, cooking or sport of some sort. How did you discover that climbing could be something that you could be rather good at? Um, so I, I just randomly tried it on a school trip when I was seven or eight and I liked it, but it was sort of not really that. Um, the next day we got to do it again and I got to the top of the wall and I think the sort of adrenaline rush of touching the top hold and things was really nice and I came back to my parents and sort of went I'd like to do it again um I'd like to take this up as a hobby my parents were like no too dangerous and also I was literally doing uh three to four sessions of karate a week I was competitive at that point um so we um yeah it never really happened and then I had cancer uh nearly 10 years ago and the cancer had followed several other surgeries which had meant um i was really deconditioned i was struggling with my walking uh i was struggling with my movement generally but the cancer surgery went my left arm um i was struggling with things like shampooing my hair and doing my socks like real independence things and one of my really good friends um suggested i go climbing with her as a way to actually strengthen my left arm and get me mobile again um and it just became a, a thing I'd do every few months with her. Um, the freedom I got from that first session of sort of just thinking about the holds and not thinking about what was going on in my life was quite liberating. Um, and then, yeah, and then I moved to London, realized I really enjoyed it. So five years ago, I took it up as a proper thing. And uh, you say take it up as a proper thing. I mean, you know, you, within five years, the, the level of success that you've achieved it, it, it is extraordinary. Give, give us just an idea of some of the stuff that you've done. Um, well, so I, I mean, I, I sort of five years ago, you know, my flatmate and I decided to just climb as complete amateurs, not really knowing much aside from tying our knots and stuff. And we turned up at the climbing wall and around the same time, Reach had contacted me actually to say, do you know there are para climbing competitions in the UK? And I went, oh my God, you have para sport? Because that's not a thing I was like, growing up at Luxembourg, para sport wasn't really a thing. I had to compete able-bodied. So to know there was a para sport and to know so much had happened in my life in the previous years, this is great. I haven't trained in 10 years. My body's massively changed. Um, what if? So I decided to start training. This knowing I could still couldn't walk from the nearest tube station to the climbing center. So I would have to take the bus to the climbing center, which was a nine minute walk, um, because that would tire me too much to walk, to actually climb. That's kind of the level of fitness I was dealing with. Um, and yeah, within that first year, uh, I ranked second, I think. Um, and then it sort of, sort of stayed around that sort of range of sort of second to third, sometimes fourth, um, every year I've competed. Um, but more than that, I actually realized um, um, sort of linked to sort of the feelings of isolation I'd had in Luxembourg to a certain extent with disability, but also in terms of cancer and things like that. I realized I wanted to start blogging and talking about it, um, about the barriers to sport, the fear I had of going to the climbing wall the first time without knowing anybody, the fear of what I'd look like, uh, the fear of making a mistake, the fear of falling and things like that. And I started, started blogging uh, and those blogs really took off um in a way that i don't think anybody was expecting least of all me um and yeah five years on i now basically have a following um share my life story a bit share what i learn um share when the days don't go so well uh and share when the days go great and it, it's extraordinary as you say the following that you have but uh, so much of it comes from you know you, you just have this incredible openness about as you say when the days don't go so well well and i think comes really 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 positive for people when they realize because you can't just see somebody in the up position all the time you know it's, you, you've got to see people throughout and that showing that bit of vulnerability is, is incredibly important for everybody else to really relate uh, to you. And we're, we're going to open up the questions fairly shortly in about five minutes. So uh, for watching at home, please get, get ready with those questions. There's a couple of areas I just want to talk about first. Uh, one is 
this resilience that you have, you, you mentioned cancer there. You've just been through another operation again fairly recently. You've had a lot of health concerns throughout your life, you know, way in excess of any limb difference. And yet you seem to have this ability to bounce back and to stay positive. What do you put that down to? Because it, it's something that we would all love to be able to have, but some people can manage it and some people really struggle. It's definitely not innate. I definitely learned to do it. Um, so until I had cancer, my basically I had cancer when I was about the age of 23. And from the age of 15, I went from just having a limb difference to suddenly having health issues. Um, and we didn't know what was going on at the time. I, we now know I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome alongside a vast number of other issues. But at the time we didn't know. So I had this unknown thing attacking my body my body was failing me. I developed quite a poor body image and um, it was very much so in my mindset, why me, what next, really scared. Um, then I had cancer and I probably my rock bottom moment in terms of my mental health because it was like, I don't think I can handle yet one more thing on top because it was quite a lot to handle, as you can imagine, um, to deal with a cancer diagnosis um, and then treatment. But um, I, frankly, I, I, I realized I couldn't really keep doing this sort of living in this why me being scared. I was so scared of what was going to happen next that I stopped living my life in the way I should have been. I wanted to live it um, because I wasn't making, you know, I was scared of going out for a long walk just in case something else would happen. I was scared of, you know, that, that was my life. I'd become scared and I decided to change that. I decided to stop being scared of, I'm still, obviously, I'm still scared of the future. I mean, nobody isn't, but what I mean to say, I, I stop. I decided to stop letting that ride my life and become the dominant thing. And I decided to say, okay, I'm scared and I acknowledge that and I recognize that and I'm going to have some chocolate or some chicken wings or some ice cream or some tea to help me out with what I need to do and watch some lovely TV or have a rant or have a cry, whatever I need to do to process those emotions. Um, talk with a friend, talk with family. And then I'm going to go, okay, this is the situation I'm in now, right now what can i do and that's become my mantra now wow. how it's, can i manage within it it's so inspiring to hear you you you, you talk like that and i'm you know you, you make it sound quite matter of fact which i'm sure it, it absolutely wasn't you know you've been through incredible highs and lows uh, along the way and i just want to finish off before we uh, go into those questions for people because i see them starting to come in already is to uh, talk about the future and your challenges you uh, we were talking about just before we uh, we started this interview about some of the things that you've got planned and i'm just exhausted even thinking about them uh, so <laughs> give us an idea of what's on the agenda over the next six months and beyond um so last year i was actually training for a really fantastic project before my health took a massive decline and covid became a thing so i um, I, I've now gone from being somebody who was rather rather able aside from arm and rather other issues to now being a, a, full, a nearly full-time wheelchair user at the moment because I'm struggling to walk in a big way. Um, I can't leave my house independently at the moment and it hasn't happened for a year. Um, so I decided that now that I've had major abdominal surgery and I'm going to have to do a lot to get fit again and I absolutely hate cardio why not turn this into something I'm going to enjoy? So I've decided to um, go slightly mad and um, indoor cycle uh, the distance from Land's End to John O'Groats. Um, in, indoor row, the length of the Thames, I just haven't decided the exact distance yet because we're still working out. I tried rowing a week ago, it still isn't working out yet. So we're still trying to work out where my baseline is. And um, indoor climb Everest. Now I did indoor climb Everest uh, over a few months, about uh, three years, four years ago, is my um, sort of commemorating my fifth year post cancer and raising money for charity. So it's kind of in that spirit. I'm reaching my 10 years. I want to do something for charity again. I've decided to split it amongst all the charities I love, including Reach, this year. The charities need money. I need motivation. Let's put the two together and get myself fit in the process. Wow. And uh, I love the way you just say, oh, I'm just going to do, uh, you know, uh, Everest climb and uh, uh, cycle lands in Stromagos. Yeah. I have you know? a rebellious streak. <laughs> I have, yeah, I have I, a rebellious streak. The more I decline, the more I want to do bigger things. 
Well, it's it's absolutely fantastic, and uh, you know, I'm I'm going to hand over now to our audience for their questions, as many as they want to come in, and I might chip in with a few along the way. But for the moment, Anoushe, uh, thank you so much indeed again for joining us. You've been an absolute inspiration. It's thank you. Fantastic talking to you, and I know that people watching will also uh, be in absolute awe of uh, your ability to uh, really push ahead through all the challenges. And the first question is from Max. And uh, Max just wants to know about where you can get advice or how you can start with your paraclimbing. If you're interested in it, where, where can you go where you're going to get that level of support and you're going to be able to see actually whether this is something you want to do or not? Sure. So um, in the UK, there are actually loads of paraclimbing clubs. Um, so first bet is to actually contact your local climbing centre. But if you don't know who to contact, I'm the co-founder of Paraclimbing London, uh, and we have contacts with most of the paraclimbing clubs in the UK. So just contact Paraclimbing London either on Instagram, Facebook, or even paraclimbinglondon at gmail.com. Um, and we will probably put you in touch with your nearest walls or your nearest paraclimbers. Um, and if you are London-based, by the way, just a plug for Paraclimbing London, we take anybody who's never tried a climbing wall before to elite athletes. We've got loads of people and if you just turn up and you really don't want to climb because you're intimidated or tired just stick around and have a chat <laughs> that sounds like a good enough advice to me i'm not sure where you're based max but um you know if, if nothing else get yourself down to london if you can um but uh, hope or, to yeah or just contact us centers. and we'll get you in touch with the right people a lot of acceptance for people with limb difference at these uh, climbing centers today uh, absolutely brilliant. I've not had any issues. Um, I, uh, in fact, uh, uh, my particular climbing centre have gone out of their way to find ways to to make things easier for me in terms of how I belay. Or uh, at the moment, I'm a seated climber in terms of when I am belaying somebody else, and they've just really gone out of their way to to help. I mean, they sponsor me, and we have a really good relationship. But I've not had. I've not heard of any other issues in any other climbing walls, and I tend to hear of them quite early on if there are any, because people often come to me to ask me to word stuff for them to get to that climbing wall and explain. Um, I think, yeah, maybe one issue in seven years, I think. Brilliant. Total. No, that, that, that's, that's really fantastic. That's really good to hear. And I, I think there's no question that the world has changed dramatically in the level of acceptance of any form of difference, whatever that difference might be. And I knew this would come up about confidence and how do you develop confidence. And, you know, I've heard you say that your conditions may disable you, but you're not disabled. And it's an incredible mindset. And we've, we've had a, a message come in from Sarah who said she came across you on Instagram and she is in awe of your determination. And she would like to know, what advice would you give to a shy 12 year old who holds herself back? And I'm sure this will apply to so many youngsters out there. So I am still quite shy, would you believe? Um, you put me into a situation where I'm not sure what, who I, you know, the, I don't know the people around me. I, um, I've never done something before. And actually, it's, it's, quite, it's quite scary taking that first step to do something new. Um, and I often, I have friends who push me because they know once I've started, I'm okay. Um, so I'd say if you're shy and, you know, you're, you know, you're quite scared about trying something, but you really want to try something, take it little by little. If you're scared of trying something, why don't you just go to the place and see other people trying it? Why don't you ask the questions you want to ask about what you, what you want to do? Um, familiarize yourself with it and take it bit by bit and eventually you'll get there. But it is about taking little steps rather than taking no steps at all. Yeah, I think that's great advice about little steps. Really, really good. We've got another question came in from Carl. And actually, funny enough, I was going to ask this one as well about the um, what prosthetics or adaptions you wear when you're climbing. You know, what, what, what do you have? Um, so in climbing, in, in competitions in any case, you're not allowed to wear prosthetics, not for upper limb. Lower limbs, another matter, obviously. Um, but um, so people can choose yes or no to wear a leg um, if they are lower limb. But upper limb, you're not actually allowed to wear anything that could essentially aid you uh, in climbing. So some power climbers will wear tape on their arms just to protect the skin. Um, I tend not to do that anymore because I found it was actually, um, I react to the glue on the tape. 
so it was causing me more problems eventually than that and if you get sweaty sometimes the tape comes off and you fall off because the tape was holding you on and not your skin so i've just taken the time to to get my skin tougher and and climb truly really. um but I, some people were wear were wear aids uh, you know tape or some sort of sock protection i used to when i started climbing um, at what the about beginning. during the training process? Do you use do you um do, to build up your strength? You're talking about you know your your arm strength and things. Do you do anything during training to help at all? Do you have any adaptions or anything, or do you just um, as as real as it were? It's as as real as it gets, really. Um, the only time I now wear tape is because I have Ellis Danlos syndrome, and sometimes my joints decide they don't want to play ball and pop out and things like that. I'll have tape to hold them in place. Um, or to provide a bit more support, um, um, but that's that's it. It's just my climbing shoes, my chalk bag, and me, really. Um, as I said, um, if you're brand new to climbing, you haven't done it before, you want some protection because your skin's not used to it, I totally recommend wearing a sock at the beginning, at least while you're getting familiar with how you might move as well, um, so you can understand how your skin's going to cope a little bit but over time i'd actually recommend not using much protection aside from tape if you decide you want that okay really 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 good advice and uh, you've already said that uh, you're going to be trying you've started rowing you've uh, oh, still trying to master that one um and then the the, the cycling and uh, everything else and um, we've had a question about are there any other sports you'd like to try uh, at some stage in the future um, so I used to do competitive swimming as a kid and then competitive martial arts as a, as a sort of teenager. So I've done those. Apparently I tried ballet as a child and hated it. Um, I don't remember it. Clearly I've blocked it from my memory. Um, I have done Sri Lankan dancing as well. Again, very young when I did that. Um, I tried a lot of sports. So one of the problems is when I was 16, I had to stop all sports because we didn't know what was going on with my joints. And so I spent a lot of time trying to find another sport I'd fall in love with. So I've done actually quite a range of them, um, trying to work out what to do. I would really like to try ice climbing. It's probably the next big one for me. Um, ice climbing, how does that work? I think just... So the idea is that when it's the height of winter or things like that, you've got um, waterfalls that have come down and frozen over. And you have like ice axes and you sort of go up. So I know an ice climber who's an upper limb difference as well. So he's got an adapted ice axe. And I just think just the fact that he's managed to adapt his ice axe and, and he's getting up and he's doing his thing. I think that's just absolutely so cool. So I really want to go up and ice, ice, ice climb one day. Now you clearly, and I, I was thinking this when you're talking about all these climbing walls and, and you know going up ice sheets and things, you clearly don't have a fear of heights. Or if you do, how do you overcome it? But the point is, did you have, I mean, this question actually came in, did you have a fear of heights? Was that almost part of the buzz to get over that fear of heights? I have a fear of falling. And I still have it, by the way. I still have a fear of falling. So the bizarre thing about my climbing is I can climb on a rope in a harness and I am okay falling in my harness on a rope. So often I fall in the air and I'm used to that and I'm okay with that. But my God, put me on a climb where there's no harness and I can't even walk off the thing 10 centimeters up. I can't walk off it. So I'm actually terrified of taking an uncontrolled fall. Part of that is rational because I have joints that pop out. Um, but part of it, it's a, it's a phobia. It's an actual phobia. I, um, when my coach and I would train um, getting on those types of climbs with no ropes, really low down, really gentle steps, um, I'd have to take, he would bring in a cup of tea for me and I would bring in my big lion Simba because we knew I'd have a point where I just need to sit down and cuddle Simba. That's how scary I find it. You know, one of the things that people often see when we talk to paraclimbers or you know, sports people or people who've just achieved in whatever field they've decided to uh, train in. We we always assume that their lives are pretty well taken up in that because you're a civil servant by day. You obviously yeah. are doing this in your spare time. Do you have any other sports or any other kind of hobbies that you do um, just to give you that bit of downtime? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I live a, I mean, when, when I'm in full time training, I have a quite a structured life because if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to do other things I enjoyed too. 
So um, yeah, it's work full time um, at the maximum of training time. If you include them in the gym or other things like that, physio and whatever else, probably about 16 hours a week. Um, add commuting to all of that, of course. Um, and then on top of that, then, you know, I'm, I'm now married. So there might be some cooking time or time with my husband. Thankfully, he's a power climber too. So he totally understands where we're coming from when it comes to training. Um, but then also, like, I enjoy reading. I enjoy listening to podcasts. I crochet. So I make blankets from my local hospital, um, chemo unit for patients there. Um, uh, when I'm not doing that, um, I love baking. Um, yeah, I have quite an act. I love getting myself into it. Like, you can see yarn just behind me there. There, there you go. My yarn. Uh, I even brought a stash of yarn with me back home to my parents to recover from surgery because I knew I wasn't going to be able to not cross it. I also love video gaming. It's, uh, I'm, I'm exhausted, as I said before, uh, even thinking about all of the things that you do. And I, I feel so lazy compared uh, <laughs> to what you're doing. Um, okay, questions come in here, which is, again, we, we touched on this one earlier on about motivation and how much your parents were involved in the decisions to try different sports and things and how much came from you how much was you nagging them to let you try this let you try that how much was them saying hey have you tried this have you tried that um so swimming was definitely them because my brother was already swimming uh by the time i was old enough to start so that was definitely them uh martial arts became a thing of um at one point Kozlocksmerg's at the time was a bit weird on para sports. I'd gotten too good to be in the amateur team, able-bodied, not good enough to be in the professional able-bodied team. So they wanted to put me in a para group that wasn't necessarily, there wasn't a pathway for making progression. It was just a, a group of kids with different disabilities who could swim. And my parents weren't really keen on me, I guess, being labeled that way um, or, or not reaching my potential. So they moved me into martial arts, which the, the center is not far from home. So it was kind of a convenient thing. They let me try. I enjoyed it. And we didn't really look further for other sports. I used to play cricket as well because dad was into it. Um, I used to be on the sort of the women's team locally for a couple of years. Um, um, and, you know, obviously, if there's ever a chance where we were on a family holiday to try different sports, we'd try them. But martial arts is kind of my life before climbing. So I didn't really want to try. Well, I mean, obviously, as a hobby. Um, so it was more them. I, I definitely nagged about the climbing, um, but uh, only started like when I was an adult and they couldn't say no. Well, you taught me something new today. I didn't ever know there was cricket in Luxembourg. So that's something that I didn't yeah. ever know. Well, there you go. Of course, yeah, and, there is. <laughs> now, looking at your motivation, you know, do you think that motivation was inherent within you from the beginning? Or do you think it was something that was instilled by your upbringing, by your family? Um, you know, because sometimes, you know, you, you said before that positivity, you can definitely learn that. You can learn to, you know, get out and do stuff and, and push yourself. But what about that initial motivation? Do you think it was inherent? No, I don't. Um, I do think that was also learned or, or taught um as a as a kid so i had stage fright i still do in fact have stage fright i would refuse to even go to the front of my classroom to pick up a paper from the teacher that's how scared i was of people looking at me um maybe there was an inherent thing of i'm different so i don't want to be up in front of everybody i don't know i didn't verbalize it at the time so we don't know why where it was coming from um but it meant i was really shy i didn't want to get out and do things you know when i'm feeling a bit low or a bit uncomfortable I, I'm still like that I will fall back into that sort of you know if there's a really cool thing happening I might just not do it because even though I want to I there's a barrier for me to do it um and I often have to have a word of myself going why why are you not doing this what's stopping you is it energy is it this or that and what can I adapt around it to help me make that barrier less difficult yeah, that, that's really, really interesting because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people wondering, and especially parents, wondering how much to get involved uh, with in, in effectively pushing their children versus allowing them to craft their own route. 
I'd say definitely, rather than pushing, I'd say have conversations. So if you're seeing your kid being reluctant to try something, try and identify what the barrier is. If the barrier is just because they're scared because they don't know what it's going to be like, then that's something you can, you know, take those little steps and see whether they actually enjoy it. And if they don't enjoy it, fair play. But if it's something where they're, you know, they've got a valid, really valid reason for not wanting to do it, or maybe they've had a past traumatic experience, maybe something's been said to them that they really... I got really discriminated during my martial arts days. Um, I got stopped from competing and had a teacher refuse to talk to me because I had a limb difference. Um, and, you know, that's that type of experience can be really traumatizing, especially because I refused to tell my parents because I didn't want them pulling me out of the sport. So I stuck with it, despite the fact that I was having an awful time over there. Um, and that type of thing can be really hard. And sometimes your kid might not want to say something. So there are I'd say don't push, but be really attentive to what they might say and why they might be saying. Yeah, that's really, really good advice. Thank you so much indeed. It's It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm just going to finish off with one more thing. Um, we, we I think we've answered everybody's questions who has written in, but obviously if you've got a last minute question you want to ask Anoushe, then uh, please do uh, put that in the chat very quickly. But I'm going to finish off by just asking you about your dreams and aspirations for the future. You've achieved an extraordinary amount already. You've overcome the most extraordinary challenges as well. What what would you like for the future? Where do you see yourself? What do you think you would you will be doing in say five, ten years time? Oh wow. Uh big questions. Um I think uh, primarily at the moment, I am in a battle for my own independence in terms of my physical independence right now. So my dream and aspiration would be to maintain that physical independence and thrive, be able to thrive physically in life, which at the moment is, is very much so where, where my sights are at and hence where the charity challenge is slowly being set up to help me get there again. Um, one of the things uh, that riles me uh, as a person is injustice in society in terms of how people are treated not because of who they choose to be but who they are so whether that's a limb difference whether that's a color of skin whether that's um sexual identity um all, all of that i feel it's not fair that somebody is treated differently because of something that they are rather than something that they choose to be um and so i really like working on trying to destigmatize things and reducing the boundaries or the barriers for people who do experience those barriers. So that's kind of, I suspect, where my career is leading me um, generally. Um, so yeah, in five years' time, keep doing what I'm doing now, just in a bigger way, I guess. And actually, I've got a perfect question to finish with. Uh, Max has just uh, popped in another question into the chat. And I think this is yeah, something Max. that I've seen a lot throughout these interviews and all the time that I've been around reach families and reach children is the way that maybe their limb difference has given them more empathy and a greater ability to help others. Do you think there's something in that particular comment? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I definitely say limb difference has definitely um, made me more empathetic because I'm different. By, by the fact of the matter is I will stick out in a crowd. Um, and, and also I wear a headscarf, so that makes me different again. Um, and then, mm -hmm. and then also I have invisible illnesses, um, which, which do cause some problems and that makes you more empathetic to what you can't see. So when somebody's having a, an issue, whether that's mental health or, or something like that, you, you can't see that physically. It doesn't physically manifest on somebody, somebody, right? That doesn't mean they're not having issues. So it tends to make me less hopefully and sometimes i'm not great at it but sometimes you know that's just life i'm human um but you know hopefully less less willing to judge on first on first looks at somebody yeah no i completely understand that it, it makes perfect sense and actually your incredible experiences does lead me to think that um as someone who's in, in in the speaking business that you know i can imagine you if you've overcome that um stage fright delivering amazing keynotes oh, yeah. inspirational speeches and is, is that how much of that are you doing and also have you ever thought about putting pen to paper and actually writing down your story 
So it's happened. Uh, <laughs> so I started giving keynotes about five years ago. Um, in fact, my parents, because they knew I had stage fright, actually put me on stage to give thank you speeches to 800 people at one point. So as a five-year-old, by the way. So that's kind of where I started learning how to get over the stage fright. Because um, they actively went, we can't have her being shy like that. Not okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, I gave probably my first keynote in, in the UK um, about five years ago, and that was to about 500 people. Um, so if, if I had to learn how to get over stage fright, it was around then. Um, I rely on bananas and tea, basically, to get me over the stage fright. Um, and 10 minutes calm before my talks, when nobody talks to me and I blast loud music in my ears. Um, that was um, just to sort of escape uh, from the moment. Um, I actually uh, wrote a chapter for a book called uh, Tough Women in Adventure, which got released last summer. Um, and yeah, I podcast a lot, actually. So I'm out there um, on a really regular basis, uh, whether that's via um, sort of the more social media, internet stuff like podcasts and Instagram and things, or whether that's up to natural media as well. I've done a bit of that, too. Well, I know you will have inspired everybody who's been on the call this morning. So thank you so much indeed for that. Let's just finish off by um, letting people know how they can get hold of you. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram at Anusha Hussain, um, and that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, otherwise, you can also find me on Twitter with the same handle, um, though I don't use my Twitter account that much. Um, on LinkedIn, you can find me as well. And then finally on Facebook or on my website. So my Facebook is at Anusha Hussain one because um, if you just do at Anusha Hussain, it's my personal profile. Um, and then um, website is um, anushahussain.com. Brilliant. Anusha, you have been absolutely fantastic. It's been a real pleasure uh, talking to you, even though somewhat exhausting and somewhat um, making me feel rather inadequate in so many spaces. But uh, no, seriously, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been great to find out more from you. So thank you so much indeed for joining us. Uh, wish you all the luck with thank your you. recovery. And thank um, you. we will definitely be following you to see how well you do with all of those challenges that you've planned for this summer and beyond. So uh, good luck with all of that. And we look forward to seeing you hopefully in person at uh, another Reach Weekend when we can do it yeah. all in person. Again, we would love Absolutely. to uh, ha have you back again and uh, ha have a chat with you. And uh, maybe we can do this again on, on, a, on a platform somewhere. Uh, in the yeah. meantime, to everybody, everybody watching as well, thank you so much indeed again for your comments, for your questions. And don't forget, we'll be back again next Saturday, same time, same place. And in the meantime, do have a look at the REACH website. There's a huge amount of resources there for you to help. If you're not yet a member or if you'd like to donate or anything like that, then do go on the website and have a look and uh, make sure that you get the very most out of that. In the meantime, thank you to uh, Anusha Hussain again, Absolutely fantastic talking Thank to you. you. Have a wonderful Saturday and uh, we'll hopefully catch up again soon. Thanks very much. Yeah. Bye.